Right. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this week's uh, Exit Q and A. Um, I'm Toby again from Opal. In case you weren't here for the for the last one, so the format of this is uh, we we have Kieran McCloskey on the line, who was the person that that, that put together the fantastic video um, on underwater acoustics. Um, so this is in follow up to that. So um, we're going to ask Kieran about uh, the work that he's done, uh, a few kind of questions about his PhD. Um, if you've got any questions that you want to ask, if you've not sent them any in advance, that's absolutely fine. Um, feel free to drop me an email um, to exit you at opball.com. Um, do it during the talk. I'll pick it up and ask and ask Kieran kind of as we're going. Um, alternatively, you can pop the questions directly into the chat on YouTube if you if you'd like. Um, if you're watching, um, if you're watching this on uh, the Opal website and you can't see the chat. Um, if you click uh, the YouTube button in the window and, and go to um, play on YouTube, then that'll, that'll pop open a window on YouTube and you'll be able to see the chat there. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's basically our intro started. So, so let's kind of get on with this. So uh, thanks for joining us, Kieran, and uh, thanks for taking the time to, to, to kind of do this with us. Thanks, Toby. Thanks for having me. Okay, so we'll start off with a few basics. So, so the questions we got, we kind of got a, a, a kind of a split between um, doing a PhD and then kind of the work that you were, you were interested in. So we'll kind of start off with just kind of the more general PhD stuff and then kind of go into the, into the kind of the, the work that you were doing, uh, just um, to start off with, I think. Um, so we'll start off with, um, so we've got a question that, um, I was wondering if you always knew that you wanted to do a PhD and how you knew it was the right path for you. Um, okay, yeah, thanks. Um, so I guess the short answer to that is um, I kind of arrived to a PhD through a lot of trial and error. So um, I was kind of, I, I originally had gone to school, my undergrad, um, and wanted to pursue medicine. I found out that this wasn't right. And then after that, I was kind of bouncing between ideas. I had a lot of interests. And my basic approach to that was just do research, talk to professionals, gain experience. Um, and it took a little bit of soul searching, a lot of support from my friends and family. Um, but I eventually landed a research internship and that's kind of what got me kind of on the path of research. I did my first literature review. I did my first kind of plan for a research project and that was for actually for a medical uh, research group uh, in New York City at Columbia University. They were studying something, some really cool stuff. It was integrative medicine. Um, and so it was kind of a very niche um, topic, and I was, I was slowly becoming um, kind of an expert in that, that really niche topic. And then all of a sudden, my supervisor asked me questions. So I really liked that aspect of it and kind of contributing to that research. Um, and then I made the switch into ecology after going on expedition to the Philippines, um, which is kind of why I really love um, Operation Well Sea as an organization, because I also kind of started my trajectory, my path into ecology through an expedition. And that's where I really, you know, I got into the field, I learned to dive, I got my first taste of collecting data in the field. And then as, since then, I've been hooked, I went on to get my dive master, I got a master's degree in ecology after that. Um, but I wouldn't have known any of this if I hadn't gone through all of the, the almost painstaking process of trial and error, figuring out what my interests are, really talking to people, and then trying to gain experience um, to get me to the, to the point where I felt comfortable and confident to pursue something. Okay. Great. So I guess just kind of following that on, um, is there a, a particular reason why you wanted, wanted to go into kind of looking at bioacoustics? Or was there something about bioacoustics that kind of drew you in? Um, I mean, to be, to be honest, um, so when I started my master's project, I was always kind of keeping my eyes and ears open for topics that I might want to do. And um, so I did my master's uh, at Exeter in Cornwall, the Penryn campus. Uh, it was a half taught, half research, uh, one year program, conservation biodiversity. Um, and we were encouraged to kind of look out for projects and interests. And I had a couple of them. And then my supervisor, Steve Simpson, came and gave a talk that just blew me out of the water. After the words, I was like, I have to talk to him. I have to see if he's got any opportunities. So I ended up talking to him after the, the, the talk and he gave me his information, we got to talking and I came up, uh, we came up with, he actually just gave me a project. Um, and I did that in Dorset, off the coast of Dorset, studying the effects of pile driving on nesting sea bream um, in Swanage and off the coast of Dorset. And um, 
yeah, I guess that's where it started. And so I did my literature review. I got immersed in the literature and, and the background material and kind of um, kept going from there. And it, 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 it's similar to what I had done before. It's a little bit of a niche topic, but I kind of, uh, kind of like fitting into that niche and, and being almost a little bit of the outsiders in ecology. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting topic. Okay, so just also related to kind of PhD, um, what made you want to complete your PhD in the UK? Uh, did it cost any more financially for you to do that? Or was there a particular reason you chose the UK? Yeah, I, get, I kind of get this question a lot. Um, and there are a lot of different reasons. Some of them are personal, but mainly I was switching fields and, and I wanted to get a fresh start. Um, and actually financially it was um, less expensive for me to do a, a master's degree for a year in England with a scholarship that I had than it would have been for an out-of-state master's program in the US. So uh, we'll get into the politics of that. But um, the program in Exeter was really great um, and it, it was advertised very well. It had all of the pieces that I wanted. It had the half taught, half research, had a field course, had um, some really big names in marine ecology. So it actually was a, a good opportunity and, and I took it. Um, and uh, sorry, what was the, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought. And then <laughs> you, you answered by, by basically by, by thought, by thought the question. Yeah, I think, I think that's my, my answer. I'll stick with it. <laughs> okay. So, so kind of just uh, moving kind of, I, I guess off the topic of the PhD, but more towards kind of like generalist diving kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what's the most special encounter or experience you've had with wildlife uh, underwater? Um, so I've actually been lucky enough to see some pretty cool things. Um, I always get excited about um, finding a rare species or something that you wouldn't normally find um, in the wild. And it's usually when you're not looking for them is when you kind of spot the really cool things. Um, but actually the one that really um, pops out in my head is um, a really cool um, interspecific behaviors. Um, so in the Great Barrier Reef, a uh, couple of times I was uh, witnessing grouper and octopus act actually hunting together. Um, and I think this was on uh, Blue Planet 2. Um, they had some footage of this, but basically a grouper would swim along and kind of identify a prey and then chase it into little holes or little um, hideaway pieces of coral. And then it would just sit there and kind of point and identify where that fish was. And then an octopus would come along somewhere and then it would just kind of stick all of its tentacles into the holes, try to either catch a fish for itself or it would chase the fish out and then a group would come along and snap that up. And I, I saw that a couple of times in the Great Barrier Reef. I actually got it on, on video for one of our studies. It actually happened, unfortunately, to our unsuspecting. Um, so in, in, our last, in the last study I talked about, uh, we actually presented a, a male fish in a bag, in a plastic bag. And if you're a grouper along, that's just the free lunch. So actually the groupers came, it pointed out to that fish in the bag, and then an octopus came, and then it was all carnage to the bag. I, uh, I feel bad about that, but no ambos were killed in that study. Uh, don't worry, all the fish were safe in that plastic bag. But um, we did catch that on camera, and it was pretty, um, a sad story for the fish, but it was amazing to watch. I guess it's something that, unless you've been diving, a lot of people don't really kind of appreciate how wildlife interacts underwater and how it all kind of um, uh, interacts with other species and similar species. Right? Definitely. Um, okay, so um, on a similar kind of like generalist uh, diving side of things, but also kind of working towards the kind of the topic you talk in your PhD, um, how much um, of the noises from the coral reef can you hear to the naked ear without sound recorded equipment? Uh, can you expect to be able to hear uh, sounds uh, while diving yourself? Um, <clears throat> so our ears aren't are very well adapted to pick up sound underwater, but you'd be surprised um, if you actually kind of train yourself to listen out for those noises, how much you can hear when you're either diving on a reef or snorkeling on a reef. Um, but there will still be a lot of interference when you're usually kind of doing those activities. So scuba gear itself is really loud. So when you're breathing in through your regulator, a lot of times all you can hear is you're in and out sounding like Darth Vader underwater. Um, also with the snorkel at the surface, you know, breathing in, in and out, it, it kind of um, kind of takes over what you can hear. But if you if you do if you do it safe enough, you dive down or you um, you snorkel down and maybe you hold your breath for a couple seconds and, and do that safely, you'd be surprised at, at all the sounds that you can actually hear. And um, 
a lot of myself and, and my uh, colleagues will kind of do this when we're, when we might hear a sound when we're snorkeling along, we'll kind of dive down, listen for a minute and then head back to the surface and see if we can spot what's making that noise. And, and we, we like doing that. It's kind of a little treasure hunt for us. Okay, um, so the next one we've got is, um, let's have a look, let's go through the list. Um, how much of your PhD is time away for research and has the current crisis affected you at all in the work that you're doing? Um, so uh, right now I'm lucky enough to spend um, probably about two to four months a, a year doing field work, which is, um, and I get to go to some pretty amazing places. So I've been to the Great Bay Reef, Honduras, um, with Operation Malasi. I also um, have done some work in the UK. Um, and unfortunately, with the crisis going on, uh, my field work, which would have been with Operation Malasi, has been postponed to next summer. Um, but I'm lucky enough that I have enough uh, projects and I have actually a desk-based project that I can focus on now, which I'm actually very excited about. Um, it has to do with um, computer modeling and modeling the effects of noise on populations. It's something I've always wanted to do um, to teach myself to do, and, and it'll be a part of my um, PhD, kind of hopefully in the ending um, portion of my PhD. So I've, I've kind of just flipped the timeline. Instead of doing this later, I'm doing this now, and then um, we'll hopefully um, be able to do that field work at a later date. Um, it'll still be part of my PhD. Um, in terms of my topic with the crisis, um, I've actually seen a couple of even uh, news stories about um, how our quieter oceans are actually um, benefiting a lot of um, kind of observed populations of especially marine mammals. So I think I saw an article about uh, whales and dolphins being sighted closer to areas where they normally wouldn't be sighted um, off the coast of, I believe, Scotland. Um, and um, most people are attributing this to the fact that there's less activity from boats, there's less construction right now, there's uh, a halting of military exercises. So, and these animals that rely heavily on noise are able to go to areas where they normally would be kind of excluded from because of the levels of noise. Um, so th those are really interesting stories. And I think once the crisis is all over, I think there will be a, a wealth of kind of information uh, about not only noise pollution and how it's, it's decreased and, and benefited animals, but in general, our general activity and how it's uh, actually maybe benefiting the environment. So hopefully we'll be, um, scientists in general will be able to put a positive spin on that and to really uh, push forward positive change for the environment. I guess this kind of uh, naturally brings us on to the next question, which is uh, what do you think will be the biggest implication of your research or the work that you're doing? Um, so I think the ultimate goal that I would want for my work personally, and um, I, I think a lot of my uh, colleagues would agree, is, is more of an awareness and a proactivity towards um, noise pollution. And um, it, it's kind of an interesting topic to study because there are a lot of potential benefits that we can have. We can control when where and how we introduce noise into the environment. And there's lots of small changes that we can do to reduce noise that will not affect daily life or productivity um, that could actually have a, a really big benefit to wildlife. And I think when you have these changes that would benefit the wildlife and you have those success stories, it ends up being a knock-on effect where you're kind of building confidence in us as, a, as, as us as a collective society to tackle these environmental problems and then maybe address the bigger issues such as climate change, ocean acidification. I've got one really good example of this. Um, so where I was working in Swanage, um, the pier there, the Swanage Pier, uh, it's an historic pier, was actually um, slated and it was actually uh, renovated, I believe last summer, the summer before. But there is an important seagrass bed around the pier and within that pier there is protected populations of seahorses and uh, environmental managers and the construction companies were able to get together and then come up with a plan that not only benefited the res uh, restoration of the pier, but also protected those important uh, populations of seahorses. So they used an alternative method of construction. It's called vi uh, vibro piling, where instead of using, um, so if you're, if you're putting piles into the seabed, you typically use an impact hammer, which is really 
impulsive, it's a loud sound, it's been shown to negatively affect a lot of different species. Um, an alternative to that uh, that's being used more commonly is vibration piling. So instead of impacting, you're just vibrating and digging that pile into the ground. It's less, um, it's less of a, a loud impulsive sound and it's actually more cost effective for construction companies. And on top of that, they did the construction outside of raising season. So you're able to protect those seahorse, but then also to carry out that important construction work of the Swanage Pier. So when you have a success story like that, it, it really kind of builds confidence in our ability to really tackle those, uh, those problems. And another success story obviously is um, Tim's work, which I presented uh, as the first case study. And that, that's kind of gained a huge, um, I guess, positive outflow of media coverage because it is such a good story to tell and it kind of just almost really inspires and builds confidence to to do that sort of work and think outside the box to protect the environment. Great, um, I guess that kind of does slightly segue into, into kind of a similar question since you were talking about kind of the UK. Um, but how much of a difference have you found kind of between the three sites that you spoke of visiting, so Honduras, the UK and Australia? Um, I.e., is the uh, is the UK noisier than research sites in Honduras and Australia, or is there a difference kind of in the, between the different locales? Um, that's a great question. So I would first start by saying that noise. I, I personally have experienced noise, and it's ubiquitous at all of these locations, but to varying degrees. So um, where I worked in the UK uh, was in Swanage, so the co the coast of Dorset, and it's a pretty uh, busy area. So um, you've got fishing vessels, um, recreation boats, diving vessels. There was even military exercises around one of the headlands near where I was doing research. Um, construction, as you, I just told you about the Swanage Pier. So there's a, there's a lot more a variety of noise sources um, from where I was working in the UK. Honduras, um, it's mainly vessel noise that you will hear, but there's actually a lot of it. So I was um, we did a study last summer and I was focusing more on the effects of scuba noise on um, uh, shrimp, uh, sh shrimp cleaning stations. And I was really surprised that uh, all of my videos uh, pretty much had a vessel going by at them. So it, it's a very uh, busy port. There's lots of um, diving on the island of Utila. There's fishing, there's transportation. Um, and I, I was actually really surprised by the level of activity that was in Honduras. Lizard Island, um, the Great Barrier Reef, um, it's it's a remote location, so there's a lot less uh, vessel noise, but there still are um, uh, a good amount of re small research votes from the um, the research station that we work from. But there's also a resort on the island, and they will kind of give their um, their um, their tourists the the tourists coming there. They'll give them tours around the island, take them on boats. Um, There'll be some fishing on the north side of that island. So really, it, I would say noise is pretty ubiquitous among all the locations that I've worked at. Um, so we've had uh, another question come in via email, um, which is basically with the distance that whale song has been known to travel, um, do you tend to find that uh, larger boats and shipping con and, and boats uh, with shipping containers um, how far does the sound travel underwater with regards to kind of the, the, the larger shipping boats? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so uh, one of my colleagues um, from um, Australia, Lizard Island, Jimmy McWilliam, he actually did um, part of his PhD on this topic. And I, I would agree that the larger vessels, I think their noise resonates further and is actually um, a shipping lane um, pretty far off of Lizard Island. And he, for, he was finding that um, through long-term recordings that that noise from the shipping lane was, was propagating all the way to Lizard Island, not only to Lizard Island, but also uh, somewhat into Lagoon. Um, and it, it depends on the kind of the frequency of the noise, the intensity of the noise, typically the, the lower frequency, um, <clears throat> lower frequency sounds are able to uh, propagate further um, and larger vessels kind of produce more sound at the lower frequency than I would say recreational boats, which tend to, it's all broad spectrum, but I would say that they would have a higher frequency signature compared to the, to the larger vessels. Um, so yeah, I would definitely agree. 
Um, similar to whales, the larger vessels actually the sound propagates um, further. Okay. Um, okay, so we're getting to um, a, a couple, the last couple of questions. So just to, in general to the audience, if you do have anything um, that you wanted to ask, uh, please feel free to kind of pop it in now, just as we're kind of coming towards the end of this. Um, but we've got, uh, so we've got a question from the chat. Um, so this is uh, from Zavi. Um, it's, uh, why did you decide to focus your intelligence on finding out about sound in the ocean? Are you fascinated by it? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so why did you decide to focus your intelligence on finding out about sound in the ocean? Are you fascinated by it? Um, yeah, I think I, I think I'm, I really am fascinated, fascinated by it. And I kind of tried to um, relay the importance of underwater sound uh, through the kind of beginning portion of the lecture that I gave. Um, and I, what I really like about it is that um, for us, it might not seem, it seems almost counterintuitive because us as humans, we rely so heavily on vision to perceive our, the world around us. And because of the differences that exist underwater, it might be the, the, a different, a different for fish and, and lots of different organisms underwater. They may use sound as their main sensory uh, modality to perceive the world around them. So, and when it comes to noise, um, I really love the analogy um, that I've heard from someone else that almost noise pollution to fish in aquatic life is uh, kind of analogous to us walking around all the time in a thick, thick fog. Um, so it's just an interesting way of thinking about it. And I think because it, it kind of is a little bit counterintuitive for us to understand, I think that's kind of really what sparks my interest in wanting to understand more about underwater sound. I can guess. I can guess from kind of a personal side of things that there's so few people that would kind of consider underwater sound as, as something that I, I can't imagine many people considering it as as, as something that's potentially harmful, just because of how different it is to kind of how we perceive the world. So um, I guess just from my perspective, do you, do you find that people have a certain amount of disbelief that it has this kind of this kind of impact? Um, I think, I think yes, but I think it's becoming more of, I think awareness is increasing, um, even since I've started studying it. I would, I would say, um, general, in general with marine biology, with the success of, of, um, work such as Blue Planet 2, um, of the campaigns against microplastics, all of these issues that, you know, four or five years ago, most people would not be aware of uh, are becoming everyday um, topics of discussion. Um, and it's actually a really cool time and, and, and really exciting time to be studying um, all of these issues with marine biology. Um, it is a little bit uh, distressing at the same time, but I think with that increased awareness, you have almost an increase um, with the kind of hope and, and the um, kind of want for, uh, for these issues to be addressed. Okay. Um, so we've got another question in, we've got actually a couple of questions in from the chat, so we're just popping up now. Um, so the first is, uh, is which opal sites have you visited and what was your favourite? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's just Honduras, it's just the, the Honduras marine sites that you've been down to, is that correct? Yeah, I've, I've, I've been to Tela, but very briefly. Um, I've only been to the Bay Islands of Honduras. I would love to go to the forest, so um, if I have a chance to go on a forest expedition, I will definitely jump on that one um, because um, I've, I've, I've been helping out giving some of the evening talks and presentations to schools. And every time I give a talk on a different country, I'm just like, oh, you, you all better go there because I really want to go there. Um, so. Um, okay, so the next question we've got from the chat is, uh, what areas of our oceans are most affected by noise pollution? Oh, that's a tough one. I would, I mean, that's kind of a, a hard one. It goes on a case by case basis. Um, I would, I would, so which areas are most affected by noise? I would say it, it really depends on the species that exists at that location, how they're affected by noise. So even within fish, um, not all fish respond to noise the same. You've got different um, adaptations to hearing sounds. So I mentioned in the talk that all fish are capable of detecting particle motion. 
Um, some of them are capable of detecting sound pressure using gas-filled organs, such as swim bladders. And even uh, uh, kind of a subset of those have an anatomical adaptation to pick up uh, a wider frequency of sounds by having an anatomical connection between the swim bladder and the inner ear. So you can see just with, within fish, there's such a variation in how they perceive sound, how they use sound, that um, the effects of sound even within fish will be um, extremely variable. Um, in terms of locations, I, I, uh, if I had to give an answer, I would say the, the locations that have those um, populations that are already at threat, maybe sound would already would kind of compound those um, problems. I know it's a, a really big issue for marine mammal populations in the Pacific Northwest, so um, uh, killer whale population in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, they're under so many different pressures, uh, mainly food pressures, that uh, scientists there believe that the added pressure of all the, the vessel traffic there is just almost pushing them over the edge and not uh, enabling that, that uh, population to really um, rebound and kind of recover um, from all the other stresses that are adding onto it. So it's a very complex um, issue um, and topic. Okay, great. So we've got um, one more question from the chat, um, which, uh, what's the next question you would like to answer related to the effect of noise pollution or the effects of noise pollution? That is also a good question. Um, so I think where my, uh, there's, there's actually, there's so many um, possible questions. So I, I, I think where I would like my PhD to end up going and kind of where I see myself going is how does all this collective noise that we have in the environment affect whole populations? Can we see um, effects on like uh, interactions between different species at the community level? I think those big picture questions are we're, we're kind of we're really good at getting the knowledge on how noise affects individual um, individuals within a population or um, individual fish, um, but kind of putting that all together and, and looking at the effects of noise at more of a community and then population level, I think those are really big, important questions. And I think um, more research groups are now starting to try to address those um, problems. Okay, um, so we're coming up to the half hour mark at the moment. So um, I'm just gonna, I've got a couple more questions to ask you um, and then we can kind of um, uh, kind of head off. But um, the, so the last two I've got were a little bit more kind of technical, I guess. Um, so those are the reasons I kind of saved it to last. So the first of which is, um, does uh, human disturbance affect different sized organisms in different ways? Um, yeah, so this is kind of similar to, um, my answer with the the variation in how fish use sound um, when you're trying to compare different size organisms between species there's going to be so many other factors that that kind of contribute to how that species is affected by um, by noise or uses sound um, and, and too much so that it would be difficult to make comparisons between species um, however, there has been research into the effects of size within one species, um, and that was actually done by uh, my research group um, before I was uh, a PhD or even a master's student. Um, so one of the PhD students actually looked at the effects of noise on um, a species of crab and found that actually the heavier crabs had a stronger physiological effect to sound, uh, to anthropogenic noise, um, than the lighter ones. And, and there's a lot of uh, reasons that they kind of postulated why that might be. Um, so yeah, so I, I feel like I'm kind of dancing around a lot of these questions, but um, it is because it is a, a complex um, question that's been asked and it, there's a lot of variation and factors to consider. Um, so. Okay, yeah. um, I guess I guess one of those factors is going to be the next question. So this is the last question you've got for you. Um, so it was a comment that we got on your original YouTube video. So it was, um, I'm curious to know if the same ecoacoustic principles you discussed, and specifically the potential noise impacts to fish exist in the freshwater environment. Is underwater sound affected by salinity? Um, that is a great question. I did see that one, and I was uh, waiting to answer it till this um, session. 
Um, so, so thanks um, to whoever asked that question. Um, so you will have the same pressures um, in the freshwater environment that you do have in, in the marine environment. And a lot of the responses that we'll see from fish will be um, very similar. Um, there might be different sources. So you might have less military exercises in a lake or a river um, and, uh, than you would off the coast of the UK. Uh, but you'll still have uh, sources of noise such as construction, um, vessel traffic will be a big one. Um, and I think that the differences in salinity really won't affect how um, fish use sound to hear, and it really won't affect how uh, a noise source may be affecting that fish. The real difference is, is um, between salinity, um, and, and salinity will affect the propagation of sound, but it'll be very uh, minuscule to a fish. Um, the real difference is, is how we would study um, that system, so it would affect our calibration for our instruments, how we um, characterize the actual sound source, all of that sort of um, thing will be different, but the rest of it will be pretty much the same. There'll still be noise sources, it will still affect organisms, and um, you might find some uh, behaviors or physiological impacts, and, and that would be um, comparable to what you would see in the marine environment. Okay. That's great. Right, that's the last of the questions. So thank you very much for, for your time, Kieran. Um, it's been yeah, an absolute pleasure. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add at the end or you know, shout out to social media or anything like that? Or... Um, no, thank you, Toby, um, for, for hosting the Q&A and, and, and doing all the, the, the legwork with the, the posting and putting everything together. And I just want to thank Op Operation Wallacea again um, for the opportunity to give this lecture. Um, it's been a pleasure. I had a lot of fun putting the presentation together. Um, these questions have been really great. Um, so really great work. Glad to be a part of it. Thanks. Okay. Right. Thank you to everybody in the audience. Um, we hope you enjoyed that. And yeah, we'll be back next week with, a, with, a, with the next episode of Exit Cheers for now. <laughs>